The day is May 22nd, 2022, and what was once a marquee event on the NASCAR Cup Series schedule has been on the backslide for the last few years, and tonight the wheels completely fall off. The race was mostly uneventful, but when it was all said and done with, no one could even tell when or where it ended or who the winner was. It was an embarrassment to the sport of stock car racing, and it was the worst NASCAR All-Star race of all time. In the early days of sports, bad events weren't just commonplace, they were the norm. The first season of NFL football ended with tons of games without any touchdowns scored by either team, and more than a few 0-0 ties. NBA basketball in its infancy featured a whole lot of guys standing around statically and making rigidly slow passes to one another before inevitably missing a shot, resulting in very low scoring games and no flashiness whatsoever. And even NASCAR had its fair share of problems in its first decade of life. Sure, races on the big speedways of Darlington and Daytona rightfully became crown jewel events, but the rank and file races on far flung small dirt tracks make you genuinely wonder why this sport ever took off in the first place. There usually weren't a whole lot of lead changes, the margin of victory was measured in laps, and the average speed at most of these races was often in the 50 mile an hour bracket. People going to these races drove faster than that on the car ride home. That's not just bad, that's stupid. Why would you pay money to watch this? But people came out by the tens of thousands to watch these races and eventually the racing got better. Shit shows back then were expected, but today they're not just rare, they're almost impossible to pull off. The drivers you see out there on the track and the players you see out there on the field are all professionals now. They don't do anything except play that one sport. These events are no longer made of factory workers and plumbers who play on the weekends for funsies. Plus, the vast majority of guys participating have been training their entire lives for this. It would take most of them completely forgetting their God-given talents for a few hours straight to make an event fall apart. Even the worst driver you can think of in the top division is in the top percentile of people who drive for a living. That person is an apex human being capable of doing things you and I could only dream of. Sure, they might stumble into the occasional blunder, but it's usually nothing more serious than one big oopsie. Not just that, but these sanctioning bodies have been holding these games for decades, if not a century. It's pretty much automatic now. So to get a shit show in today's modern age, you need some sort of outside help. Mother Nature is always there to lend her services. Just this year, the Daytona Summer Race had a race marred to hell and back with rain delays, as well as most of the field being wiped out in turn one due to a sudden shower located entirely in that one particular corner of the track and nowhere else. Arguably the worst F1 race of all time, the 2021 Belgian Grand Prix was stuck in a monsoon, and race directors ran two laps under safety car before calling the race and telling everyone to pack up their stuff and go home. The other worst F1 race, the 2005 US Grand Prix, was played with a tire war between Bridgestone and Michelin that unraveled into just six cars starting the race due to a walkout by Michelin teams. And going back to NASCAR, the worst cup race ever in 1969 at Talladega was also drop kicked by a tire war, and all but three drivers walked out and replacements were brought in at the last second. Yeah, something outside of anyone's control usually ends up spelling disaster in these scenarios, but every once in a blue moon, you get just enough people not paying attention, a few people zigging when they should have zagged, and the right people in the right places throwing their brain into a blender so you get the perfect, unassisted shit show. So what better place for this nightmare scenario to occur than a sacrilegious fake race that we made up for money? Fantastic. The NASCAR All-Star Race began its life in 1985, and the concept was pretty simple. Take all the winners from the past year and so far this year, as well as past champions, and have them race against each other in an invitational short-length event for a big cash prize. By this time, every sport had an all-star game and NASCAR was soaring in popularity, so it only made sense. The man who proposed the idea and eventually won exclusive rights to holding this event was Bruton Smith, the CEO of Speedway Motorsports Incorporated, which owned the Charlotte Motor Speedway. And that was where they held the very first all-star race. After a thrilling finish in which Darrell Waltrip ran down Harry Gant, completed a late race pass, and then allegedly blew up his own motor to skate it through post-race inspection, fans were hooked. And the race would go on to give us some of the most memorable and replayed moments in NASCAR history. 1987, the pass in the grass. 1989, Daryl Waltrip and Rusty Wallace's feud that ended with Daryl telling Rusty, I hope he chokes on that prize money. One hot night in 1992 where Davey Allison wrecks himself for the win. 1994, Ernie Irvin doing the exact same thing but coming up just short. 1995, Jeff Gordon sneaking his first all-star race win after Daryl Waltrip and Dale Earnhardt wreck each other coming out of turn four. 1997, the infamous T-Rex car that absolutely dominated the race. 1998, Mark Martin passing Jeff Gordon after he runs out of gas on the last lap. 
2001, the backup car race. 2007, the Bush Brothers feud. 2010, teammates Kyle Busch and Denny Hamlin wrecking coming out of turn two. 2014, Jamie McMurray's bonsai move on the outside to win over Carl Edwards. And that's just most of the memorable events. This was beyond a shadow of a doubt a crown jewel race for decades. If you won this race, then you were somebody. You were a big shot. But you might notice in those clips that we didn't just have the All-Star Race at Charlotte once. We had it there just about every single year. But that wasn't the plan initially. Originally, it was supposed to be a rotating race, but after the 1986 race in Atlanta had less than stellar turnout, it was brought back to Charlotte, which made tons of sense. The All-Star Race is held the week before the World 600, the longest race of the year, also at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Plus, most of the teams are based out of the Charlotte area, so it's kind of like an off week for them before heading into the 600. This also meant that fans could camp out for the whole week and catch two events. But midway through the 2010s, the All-Star Race has lost a lot of its luster. Part of what made this race so cool was how it was formatted. The race was broken down into segments, and the winner of each segment would get extra cash prizes. In some years, winning a segment would guarantee you a starting position up front in the final segment for the million dollar prize at the end, while in other years it might have you starting at the rear of the field when they invert the running order. They did a lot of other things to spice up the racing too, encouraging alternate paint schemes, double file restarts, guaranteeing a green flag finish, having a high drag low horsepower package for the cars, etc. But wait, that just sounds like a race from today. We have segmented races with stage cautions, double file restarts, green white checker finishes, the cars have less horsepower and huge spoilers, and the guys drive differently painted cars every week now. Yeah, NASCAR kind of used the All-Star Race as a test lab for things they plan to roll out in the future, which isn't a bad idea, but when you take nearly everything that made the All-Star Race special and implement that into every regular race, then the All-Star Race just isn't special anymore. It's just another race with no championship implications. And the million dollar prize isn't as enticing as it used to be. These guys get paid millions of dollars already. What exactly is the point of this anymore? However, we got the big shakeup we needed in 2020 because of the same reason that everything else got shooken up in 2020. COVID. After a shutdown of sporting events that lasted several weeks, NASCAR actually pulled off a miracle in logistics and scheduling. They still ran 36 races that year and got their TV partners the big events they signed up for. They ran three races at some tracks, did midweek racing, double headers, and moved a lot of stuff around, but they did get it done. And one of those changes was moving the All-Star Race from Charlotte to Bristol, another track SMI owned. Bristol is a high banked short track with its own crazy history of amazing racing, so it seemed like a match made in heaven. How could we possibly screw it up? Well, NASCAR debuted a number placement which looked kinda weird, and underglow lights that looked kinda weird. The race was okay, Chase Elliott, the most popular driver, won, but it was pretty forgettable. So instead of fiddling with the format of the race, SMI decided to move the event to another venue of theirs, Texas Motor Speedway. Texas is, how do I put this? Texas is not the most popular track on the schedule. As a matter of fact, it's on most people's shit list, and it's been that way since day one for that track. To start off, it only wiggled its way onto the schedule in 1997 because one of NASCAR's founding tracks, North Wilkesboro Speedway, was kicked out and left to rot out in North Carolina. Not just that, but they had to reconfigure the track after the first testing sessions were done. Pit road was too narrow, the transitions coming out of the corners were too abrupt, and it was the same old quad oval design we had seen before. 24 degree banks in the same shape as Charlotte and Atlanta too was being reconfigured into that design. It offered nothing new. It was just a worse version of tracks that already existed. Its inaugural race came around and there was a massive pile up on the first lap. They spent millions on reconfiguring the track to fix a massive bump in between turns one and two. And then for the next race in 1998, there was a massive pile up again, this time on the second lap. And they spent millions more to reconfigure the track again. That last fix actually worked though. And Texas was blessed with having just okay racing and not gigantic wreck fests. At least it worked until 2017 where they dialed back the banking in turns one and two to make the track asymmetrical. But that just made the racing worse, not just for NASCAR, but also IndyCar, which also raced there. They caked PJ1 in adhesive to the upper grooves of the track to encourage more side-by-side -side racing, and that didn't work and instead made the bottom the only practical groove. This place is just a mess. It's hanging on by, like, life support at this point. The 2021 All-Star Race goes off without a hitch or really any media attention whatsoever, and SMI and NASCAR think having it there again in 2022 is a swell idea, so now we get this shit show of a race. First off, just so you all know, I was at this race. It was my birthday that day and I was in town to visit family, and I had roped my dad into coming along with me. Now, he had not been to a NASCAR Cup Series race in nearly 10 years and barely keeps up with it anymore. He, like many former NASCAR fans, just kind of fell out of love with the sport for a variety of different reasons. But I convinced him to come to the race like the old days when we went to the All-Star Race back in Charlotte in the 90s. 
We settle into our seats and see that this place is empty. Texas used to have a capacity of nearly 200,000, and now I doubt there's even 30,000 people here. Half of the grandstands have been torn down, and the half that remain have been roped off. It's pretty depressing here. Before the all-star race proper, there's usually an open race for everybody who doesn't qualify for the main show. If you can win that, then you can place into the all-star race. Some years it was a one-off race and only one guy advanced. Other years it was the top five advanced, but this year it's broken into three stages, with the winner of each stage advancing. It's not a bad format by any stretch of the imagination, but the cars fire up and roll off and I count just 16 entrants. There's 20 cars in the All-Star Race. If we count the three winners and the guy who wins the fan vote, then that makes the All-Star Race a field of 24 drivers with only 12 being on the outside looking in. Where's the exclusivity at? Used to, if you could even make the main event, you were considered a really good driver, but now you have a two in three chance of making the big show. The open begins and Ricky Stenhouse pulls ahead and everyone gets strung out. After a caution-free stage, he wins. Stage two begins, Chris Busher pulls ahead and everybody gets strung out again. This race is boring boring as hell. There's just not enough cards on the track and the layout of Texas makes passing coming out of the corners pretty darn difficult as it is. I look at my dad and he's sipping on a beer and looking at his phone. He's completely checked out and I can't blame him. Usually watching a race in person is way more engaging than watching it on TV. You get to pick your battles, pick the driver that you like, and watch whatever happens. You're not dependent on the cameraman and the director showing you what's going on. You can see it all for yourself. But this race, there's just nothing to watch. You ever try to get a friend or a family member to watch a sport that you like, but they don't? They think baseball is boring and slow, but you say, no, no, it's great, just watch. And you put them in front of a game with your favorite team, and it's exactly what they assumed it would be, and it ends at the top of the ninth with a one to nothing score. Or you try to get somebody to watch a UFC match and tell them, no, it's not just two Neanderthals brutalizing each other, there's a lot of strategy and skill involved. And then the match either devolves into two dudes laying on top of each other for 15 minutes, or one guy executing the scariest knockout you've ever seen, and it just reaffirms every negative stereotype they've ever had. That's me right now. I have dragged my dad out to a race for a motorsport he has lost touch with, only for it to be the exact kind of snooze fest he expected. This is what a dying sport looks like. Dwindling crowds, lots of empty seats, and even the people who paid to be there really wish they hadn't. The Open only had two incidents, a quick spin by the 77 of Landon Castle, and a tangle between the 8 of Tyler Reddick and the 21 of Harrison Burton. Daniel Suarez, Ricky Stenhouse, and Chris Buescher advance with Eric Jones winning the fan vote. Alright, alright, on to the main course. Surely the actual All-Star Race will be a better show, right? Well, that depends on what you mean by better. Better X? Then yes. The main race will have four stages where only green flag laps count, and the race must end under green no matter what. Kyle Busch jumps out ahead early and just stays there. There's some decent side-by-side -side racing by virtue of there simply being more competitive cars on the track. The Open consists of the worst 16 guys in the series, so having the best 24 on track has some noticeably better product. But Kyle Busch is running away with this first stage and wins. We go to the second and it's more of the same. I'm about to join my dad in doom scrolling on Twitter when I notice that Kyle Busch has wiggled and slowed coming out of turn four. He's got a flat right rear and a humble watermelon farmer is about to make this race worth the price of admission. It's Kyle Busch. Whoa! Whoa! That was big. Got loose off the corner. Had to get completely out of the game. Oh, he's got a right rear fire. Got it right down. Yeah! Holy shit, it's a miracle he didn't flip that thing and that nobody got hurt knowing what we know now about the safety issues with these next-gen cars. But that was freaking crazy. This is probably the craziest crash I've ever seen in person, and that is only the second most memorable thing about this race. However, what ensues is more of the same from the open, cars getting strung out, and most of the passing happening on pit road in between the stage breaks. I wish I had more to talk about the actual meat of the race, but other than some minor accidents, I'm at a loss. Not a whole lot happened. The final stage kicks off with a 50 lap feature, a big departure for when it used to be a 10 lap shootout. A wreck by Eric Jones bunches up the field for the final 21 laps to be run under green. Blaney, who has been running away with this race ever since the big accident on the front stretch, builds up a big lead and wins the race without anybody challenging him. Oh well, at least this thing is over. But as I'm picking up my cooler and filing for the stairs, I notice that instead of the fireworks going off, the yellow caution lights are on. The track announcer then says over the PA, This race is not over, folks. Huh? What? But Blaney's crew is celebrating on pit road, and Blaney's window net is down, and he's literally waving to me as this is happening. No one is wrecked, and even if they did, it was the last lap. A caution flag would simply end the race. 
or at least it would in a normal race. Remember, this is the all-star race. It must end under green. Okay, so where the hell was the wreck? Nobody spun. Well, there wasn't a spin. Ricky Stenhouse slapped a wall in turn two just before Blaney crossed the line. About 200 feet before he reaches the start finish, the caution lights come on. Some NASCAR official was paying attention to a random part of the track, saw the 47 hit the wall, saw the smoke, and instinctively reached for the caution button, not realizing where the leader was. My dad, who was pretty mum throughout the race, is now furious, shouting, This is bullshit. And hundreds of people have already left the track either out of protest or not realizing what was going on. Making matters worse is Blaney can't get his window net back up and secured in place. He needs the crew to do that for him. A driver can get his window net down with one hand, but he needs both hands to secure it in place, and right now he's kind of driving a race car around the track. Since the goof was NASCAR's fault, Jonathan Hassler, Blaney's crew chief, wants him to come down pit road to fix it and not lose position. NASCAR says no for some inexplicable reason. Blaney says he's got it fixed, though, and after five laps are spent under caution, the race is resumed for a green-white checkered finish, despite the protests from other drivers, including Denny Hamlin, who say they can clearly see Blaney inside the car holding the window net in place and one-handing the car around the track. The race goes green, Blaney takes a big lead and wins. Nothing changed. It was just a goofy-ass finish for the sake of a goofy-ass finish. NASCAR later says that throwing the caution there at the end was a mistake and not letting Blaney fix his window net was also a mistake. But you guys are the sanctioning body. You could have just said the yellow was thrown in error. Our bad. The race is actually over. And nobody would have cared. Hell, you could have just not acknowledged the yellow at the end, act like it didn't even exist, and nobody would have noticed. Literally nobody at the track even noticed the yellow lights were on until the track announcer pointed it out. So many things could have fixed this massive fuck up, but no one bothered and just decided to play out the stupidest series of events they could. All it would have taken was the race director saying, screw it, I'm out of here, this race is over, it's beer o'clock. And that would have been infinitely better than having a driver risk his own life with an unsecured window net. If you ask me, they should have paid Blaney $2 million for having to win that race twice. In the aftermath, the release date for the 2023 Cup Series schedule ended up getting delayed until late September. And allegedly, the reason for that was negotiations with Fox Sports, who hold the TV rights to the All-Star Race. Rumor has it that Fox executives told NASCAR they wanted the All-Star Race to be, quote, anywhere but Texas. And Fox got their wish. North Wilkesboro, the track Texas effectively killed off, is now back from the dead and will host the All-Star Race in 2023, a decision that was met with thunderous praise from NASCAR fans of all stripes. Ironically, the track that died to give Texas Motor Speedway life has now killed off Texas's all-star ambitions. As a great man once said, the funny thing about NASCAR is, if you watch long enough, everything always comes full circle. And so there it is. What was supposed to be one of the most exciting races of the year ended up being a boring and pretty dangerous affair that ended with one of the worst, most baffling officiating calls in NASCAR history, and effectively ended the event's tenure at Texas for the foreseeable future. If that ain't enough to be the worst all-star race ever, then I really don't know what would be. Anyway, I'm Slapshoes, and I'm sorry you had to watch this.